beautiful humans and welcome to this week's episode. I am super excited to have on the show, finally, after many months of planning, the amazing Kira Love, who is, for those of you who don't yet know, you've obviously been living under a rock, she is a nutrition coach, an empowerment coach, a fitness professional. She's been on MasterChef. She's basically a wonder woman because she's also a mother of two and um, just seems to make healthy living and happy and heartful and expansive living seem to be super easy. And yet what we get to do in this episode, which I can't wait to do, is dive into how she makes that a daily practice and, and what really potentially is running behind the surface. So um, Kira is known for her authenticity, for her amazing leadership, and I'm really excited to unpack, particularly today, um, what we do when life throws us curveballs, such as divorce, and also how we navigate that with as much grace as possible and thriving into whatever it is that's meant to unfold from that space and place. And, and particularly one thing I want to pick Kira's brain about today is um, raising a healthy family, because that's something she definitely seems to have mastered with her, her beautiful children. So I will leave the rest for her to unpack, but you know, please join me in welcoming to the show, Kira. Kira, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you. Yeah, me too. All right. So Kira, before we dive in and you tell us all about generally your amazingness and, and what we can all garnish from it, I would love you to answer two questions. The first of which is, if there was an animal that best represented your persona, your personality, your way of being, what would that animal be and um, why? Um, the first thing that comes to mind, and I don't know if it's because it's like my favorite animal is a horse. Um, <laughs> I just, I have such an incredibly free spirit. Freedom is one of my highest values beyond family being a value of mine. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't like feeling trapped. I like running free. <laughs> I am with you a thousand percent on that. Freedom is my highest value too. And I can see you as a very elegant, graceful, um, free, what do they call them when they're in the wild horses? There's a special name. I can't remember. Uh, like the Brumby? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and okay. And the second question is, if you could have a superpower, any superpower, what superpower would you choose and why? Oh, I, I, I challenge, I, I think of flying. Sometimes I think being invisible, but then I think you might experience things that you're better off not hearing and seeing. Whereas flying, you know, you're sort of, that, that would be a really free feeling. Just, yeah. <laughs> I, a lot of people, I mean, when freedom is your highest value, I think flying makes complete sense. All right, let's dive in now. Can you tell us wherever you want to start the story and wherever you want to take us is fine. And we'll just move from there. But tell us a little bit about how you came to be doing what you do in the world right now and what exactly that is. Wow. Okay. Well, that takes us back about 20 years, which shows my age, but <laughs> I had a health crisis in my very early twenties to the point of where I felt like I was slowly dying. I could just feel the light um, dying inside of me. And uh, it got to the point of such a severe bout of chronic fatigue that I could barely stand for a few minutes at a time. At the time I was starting to be a teacher for early childhood. Um, I think I discovered early on that I have a gift or my gift that I've been blessed with is teaching. Um, and I've always tended to share what I'm passionate about at the time. So um, it was a two to three year journey with my health. And it was when I took responsibility back for my health and really reflected on the lifestyle choices um, and the emotional state that I was in, um, the food choices, all of those things that impact us. When I took back responsibility for those things, my body healed really quickly and I realized and felt a sense of responsibility to share what I had learned because I see this playing out um, in a lot of people in our nation uh, when it comes to health and especially with women. So I completely changed my direction and went into the health industry from there. So when you say that you see this playing out for a lot of people, what are the mistakes you see people making? Like in a nutshell, if we just cut all the politeness, what, what are we all doing wrong in your opinion around health? I can get very unpolite with this topic. No. But, well, um, I mean, but really, because I would actually appreciate us doing that because I don't know about you, but as a health professional as well, Kira, with a very similar story, having, you know, having to learn through my own mistakes around nutrition in particular, um, yeah. I feel like we lie to ourselves a lot in this space and we, we're way too complacent. Um, you, know, you know, I just feel like we're, especially in the, in the era of COVID, it frustrates me a lot that 
you know, we're, we're also afraid of dying. You know, that's really what, what's yeah. driving a lot of these, um, you know, decisions at the moment. It's like, we need yeah. to keep everyone alive. And yet most people are not alive yeah. at all. Like in my opinion, they're just, 100%. they're not dead, but they're not actually thriving alive, vital humans. And so I would really love you. Let's just not waste anyone's time today. Let's <laughs> yeah. drive it home. What yeah, at are times, they, the, what are the, the easy people making? Yeah, look, at times the lack of common sense around this kind of drives me crazy, but then I have to take myself back to the yeah. in that place. And I still don't make 100% great choices all the time. Do you know what I mean? We're all humans. Um, and so just out of love, I first want to share that that lowest point in my life has been one of my greatest gifts. So sometimes we need to go through these challenges and to not feel our best self in order to get to being our best, the better version of ourselves. Um, and I do believe people are doing their best at the time with what they know. I think my mind has always worked in being curious um, and wanting to know more. So I was always curious about what was in my toothpaste and what's in the ingredients. And that doesn't make sense because you know, Mother Nature wouldn't want those chemicals in my body every day. How is this possible? How is the government allowing this to be possible? Um, the, the place where I become um, maybe a little bit uh, full frontal for some people is at the end of the day, especially mothers, we're responsible for what we consider food in our homes. You know, we're responsible for what our children are eating. We're responsible for what we're choosing to eat. And we are literally determining the future health of ourselves and our children by doing that. And that is linked to potential in life. You know, it's the building blocks. And so if we want to feel rubbish and if we want our children to be less than what they can be, then, you know, we can feed, choose to feed them rubbish. Um, you know, our, our children only know what food is through what we provide for them. Now, that doesn't discount that we all have different preferences and all of those things, but there's certainly things that we can do starting out right, especially where possible, where we actually facilitate um, children's palate and our own, you know, and, and I even, I, I laugh, adults can be so um, attached to their preferences and it's like, you know, open your all the foods that I used to not like as a child, interestingly, when I reflect on it, and not because my mum projected them on me, but they were all the ones she didn't like. And I heard all the things that she thought about them growing up. And once I opened my mind as an adult and, and it took, you know, several tries of these foods like olives and avocados and oysters, the more I tried them, the more I realised I liked them. So we really can train ourselves to like different foods. It's with ourselves and with our children. Um, so it's setting ourselves up for success, being accountable, taking responsibility. I honestly truly believe that most people have no idea how good they're meant to feel. And so therefore they're not addicted to making the choices that make them feel good. Because I have fun on the weekend. I have wine and I have cheese platters and I have nice meals out but come Monday I don't feel good my best self from doing that and I'm actually inspired internally driven to have a green smoothie because I like feeling good so I don't need someone to come and motivate me to do that yes so I was just nodding 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 as you said so much <laughs> of that because I say that all the time Kira that people don't realize how good they can feel and as a result don't chase it because it, it literally is is an unknown entity um, yeah. And I also agree with you that we are what we eat. And that's something we hear a lot, but really have a disconnect from the depth of the meaning of it. Yeah. So I think what you said there was so powerful. And I just want to have that land for everyone. The, the comment that as a parent in particular, you get, you essentially get the power to control what food looks like, what healthy eating looks like in your home. And um, I think that that is one, quite a responsibility, but also an amazing opportunity if handled correctly. So um, I know when you were saying before that adults, and I, I have deep sympathy for adults because by the time we reach adulthood, we are attached to how we eat. I mean, we're emotionally wired. And for myself, my health was in a abysmal state because I was a sugar addict living on refined carbohydrates by my mid twenties, um, you know, with all the appropriate things um, as in inappropriate things like anti um, biotic use and poor gut health that led me into the perfect storm. You're telling for, my story. <laughs> for candidiasis. So um, I know you haven't, you've been, you've been very politically correct and not really directing people as to what's appropriate to eat and not appropriate to eat. But what I did want to say is um, that for me, when I first really came to the realization that to optimize my, my health, I had to, at least for a period, 
say goodbye to grains and yes. wheats and pastas. I, I remember. I got original time. question. Sorry, I get so passionate that yeah, I go but on. I remember <laughs> in that moment in my life, literally being like, "What is the point of living? If I can't eat bread, yes. if I can't eat pokin <laughs> noodles, I may as well just die." Like that was my attitude to it. And then I kind of had the realization: well, that could actually be where you go with this because allergies lead to you know inflammation, inflammation leads to cancer, and all the things. And so I, I finally did give it up. And that was when I got to feel what it felt like to feel yeah. amazing, to literally feel reborn. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, I'm wondering for people listening who, you know, will be saying we, and, and I know you and I are both saying you don't have to be perfect, like 80, 20 rule for sure. Yeah. But what would be the things that you, if someone's listening and going, okay, that's true. I, I probably could do a lot around my, my health. I could do a lot to elevate my my experience of wellness, what would be your top three tips like for them to really tackle nutrition? Yes, your original question was what was I doing wrong that led um, to my health crisis? It was a similar to you. I was overeating grains and sugar, which was um, causing my internal body to be a system to be completely out of balance, which was leading to massive fatigue, depression. I hated my job. I was in an unhappy relationship. So I believe it was that toxic, perfect storm of poor food choices and stress and a state of unhappiness. Yeah. And so living passionately and with purpose, I believe is fundamentally linked to our health and well-being as well and so it's getting that balance around those things that i think so when it comes to i've now worked with people for over 15 years when it comes to health and um, diet and being in the kitchen is something i'm really passionate about i'm a mother so it's about how can we create change with ease grace and flow because everything in the world seems so challenging you know we are marked to we are lied to there's so many different diets out there they all contradict each other i truly believe that we are all inherently unique and anyone who preaches a one-size-fits-all um like for me my personal opinion is misguided because we all have different uh bodies and different heritages and um so there's a lot to consider but i think when we just strip it back to basics and if we just go back to just eat whole foods but it's understanding what is a whole food anymore um, i'm working with someone i really look at what are the things that we can do because if we focus on what we can't do it feels overwhelming we want to rebel all you're hearing is you're not hearing i can't eat chocolate you just eat hearing chocolate 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 right <laughs> so your body just wants the chocolate and i you know i have to eat chocolate every day i'm a chocolate addict so for me it's about focusing on what you're going to do just adding a green smoothie every single day to someone's diet you know less than two percent of australians are eating the recommended serves of fruits and veg a day which are far lower lower than what we actually need for true health and vitality. So less than 2% are doing a mediocre job. So adding a green smoothie where you are breaking down the cell walls of those plants so you can flood your body at a cellular, cellular level with all of those beautiful plant chemicals that our bodies need to thrive. Imagine the transformation of that just one choice. That that one choice is going to crowd out the room to make a bad choice in that moment. You know, breakfast cereal that's full of sugar and completely void of really any nutritional value because it's been sitting in that box for how many years? Um, you know, or toast, right? Which has really no nutritional value again, unless you're putting some beautiful avocado or something on it. It's how am I nourishing myself? If, you know, I'm all about, look, eat bread on the weekend. It's a treat food. But if you need to eat it every day, look at that plate where's the nourishment because it's not in the bread what are you having with it what is the choice that you're making with that meal that is bringing the nourishment for your cells mm -hmm. and so the more you focus on what you choose to do if you if you think of your health as a bank account make more healthy deposits each day than unhealthy withdrawals and so you start crowding out the bad stuff without even trying and so now you're not on a diet, you're just living a healthy lifestyle. And if I'm, I'm meeting a friend after this and we'll probably, you know, have something yummy and, and whatever, but it's the next choice that counts. You know, if I've had a really beautiful lunch out with friends, I'll have a smoothie for dinner because that's all my body needs. It doesn't need a roast dinner after I've had a meal out with friends. You know, it's, it's just about common sense choices and listening to your body. Mm, yes, I so agree. And I think your point about us being bio-individual 
you know, and therefore needing unique approaches is really relevant. And I think what you're saying, I take a very similar approach. It's like, if we just try to put in the good stuff and, and you know, which is delicious, like blueberries, like we're not talking it's people. I think people think healthy food is, I don't even know, you know, but you're quite right. But I think when people say, for instance, people are like toast, the question is, why do you like toast? Because some people might want it just because it's convenient. So then it's like, well, if it's convenient, what else is convenient? Hard boiled eggs that you grab and go from the fridge are also convenient. So whereas some people are like, I just like the taste of bread, which is a different issue altogether, isn't it? But But there's um, so many upgrades you can make. And when I'm coaching someone, I will ask them in that first conversation, where is it that is your downfall? For me, it's chocolate. Before getting on this call, I literally finished the upgrade that I made for myself, which is a healthy raw chocolate fudge with nuts. It's full of protein, healthy fats. It doesn't have refined sugar in it. You know, I'm not missing out. I've just replaced it with something that's nourishing my body on a higher level. And so therefore I'm satiated because it's actually got the goodness in it. So I'm not looking for the cheap fix anymore. I'm I'm very happy with what I've had. I think that that's a beautiful point you raised. So just in every area, if we looked for a one or 2% or 10% upgrade, like how can you upgrade those weak areas and how could you potentially upgrade the, the, the areas you're already doing great in? And I agree with you, more plant, more nutrient. And the upside to that, do you agree, is that when we start to spiral in that direction, it really is a spiral and it has a knock-on effect because when we feel more vital, like you said a, a little bit earlier when you said, you know, I was in a toxic relationship, I was depressed, I hated my job. Like I always say, everything touches everything. So yeah. when, when we get sleep and then we drink lots of water and we eat the good food, there is a vibration of love, that nourishment of self that then literally emanates from us in our thought processes and our way of being, which then comes back from other people, which then it's like, we're either going up in an upward spiral or we're going down in a downward spiral. So, um, And even for those who don't understand that energetically or believe in it, the universal vibration and like attracts like, at a cellular level, biochemically, like attracts like. And so this is what we see in children especially, but there's many adults that don't eat fruits and veggies. When you're just eating brown and white foods, that's all your body knows how to crave. And so you are in a craving cycle of just wanting more McDonald's or more chicken nuggets or whatever that thing is. And so that's where green smoothies are such a beautiful tool because we can make it taste like chocolate, some plant food in there. And then over time, start to break that cycle, that craving cycle. And your, your cells know how to start craving the things that you actually need. Yeah. And I know for me, just one final thing on the craving point that you raised, which is such a relevant one because people think it's them. I love chocolate. I'm addicted. Yes. You know, the, the identity and the statement, which then of course becomes the reality for the being is, you know, I'm, I love, I love, I need, I need, but the truth is, is that, oh, I'm generally that your bacteria, that. your biome or a bloody parasite yeah. that you've been yeah. feeding for so many years. It's like, Hey, yeah. Uh, just yeah, can you please yeah. give me some of my favorite food? I was like um, a monster. I think it's sugar. important, isn't it? Yeah, I was like a monster when I was a sugar addict. It was yeah. like I could not feed the monster enough. Yeah. But on that, even with our children, but as adults, even we, we become addicted to those labels of I'm a fussy eater. That's another thing I share with parents is never label your children because not only will they live up to those labels, but often it's a way for them to make themselves unique within the family to get extra attention because they're the fussy eater. Um, And so it's okay to have challenges and I think that's normal, um, but making sure that we don't highlight that or make them feel special because of those challenges. That's huge, Kara. That is really huge because those identity labels, as you just mentioned, do stick. So notice what you're saying to your child. I agree. That's like any parent listening, please really Think in your mind, do I say you're a fussy eater or you're so picky? Do I say those things? Um, or do you say them to other you know, people they overhear? Pardon? You may be saying them to other people and they may just overhear. You may yeah, that's right. And just, then yeah. the other thing with kids, because everybody works on a positive you know, feedback. I know my girls and I have a, a thing where um, you know, we try something new every week. We don't have to like it. We don't have to say we're going to eat it again, but we try something new every week. And yes. we, you know, we celebrate each other when we do that great job for trying something new. So it's just a, it's a reaffirming of a behavior. So I know with your girls, because, you know, honestly, they look like master chefs in the making themselves from what I can see from your amazing stories. On I'm Instagram. trying. 
um, the macaroons. I think, is it macaroons or macarons? Macaroons. Macaron. 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 Yeah, I always get it wrong because I say <laughs> the macaroon is like the coconutty thing, isn't yeah. it? And the macaron is the meringue. One of your daughters is like perfecting that, isn't she, at the moment? Yes, it's taking a while to perfect, but yes. Well, I think because they're bloody hard to make, so I think she's doing well. But um, I wanted to know, what would you say for the parent listening who's like, well, that's all good and well, but Kira, I think I've kind of balls it up because my kids, you know, I've let them eat the stuff or, I've, you know, we've gone too far this way. You know that old, I'm too far this way, it's too hard to course yes. correct. Yes. What would you say to a, someone listening? How... Like, what do they do if their child wants junk food? What do they do if their child is like, I don't want to eat the vegetables? Like, I don't know, just a random couple of tips. But, you know, you know, our next generation do, does need to be nourished and nurtured with high vibe food. So what can we do? What are some tangible tips that you recommend in the home? Patience and persistence is so important. I get as a parent, especially mothers in today's world, juggle every role, quite often we're the provider, we're mothers, we're lovers, we're friends. We need to take care of ourselves. There's a lot. It's heavy. Um, and so it's patience and persistence. And it's that one step at a time because one habit change will lead to long-term uh, health transformation. And so it's one habit change at a time. So focusing on what they do like and, you know, adding one new thing at a time. I love what you said about trying a new thing each week. Give children ownership, take them to the mm -hmm. shop, let them choose a recipe that you're, they're going to help you cook because they're going to be excited to try new things because of that. Let them choose a fruit or vegetable that they've never seen before. Let them research how how do you even prepare that? How do you cook it, right? They don't have to love it when they try it, but the point is that they're trying it. Um, we have a saying, three spoons to learn to love it. You have to understand that a new taste and texture is going to take 10 to 20 goes, usually minimum, before their body starts to really understand and like what that is. There's still going to be things that they won't reach for ever, um, one of my daughters absolutely loves cherry tomatoes. The other one absolutely hates them. So I don't put them on Jordan's plate because she detests them, but I give her more of what she does love. Yeah. Um, both of them have a much greater preference as do most children for raw vegetables. So even though I'm having my veggies in a curry all cooked up and delicious, I put theirs on the plate raw because then there's no argument and they're probably healthier for them that way anyway. So it's really focusing on those things that you can do. And, you know, the one tough love, and I think the bring that home to understand the importance of being seduced into training our children. And we need to take responsibility for that because when we're feeding our children foods that are filled with additives and preservatives and, a host of other chemical, you know, shit storm, if I'm allowed to say that, yeah. um, really are we treating them? And so the one thing that always I come back to that kind of drives me nuts is imagine walking down the street and seeing a toddler smoking a cigarette. It mm -hmm. would cause outrage. Smoking over a lifetime leads to cancer, but guess what? So does drinking Coke. So does eating McDonald's. But we're not outraged at seeing toddlers eat these things. So my children didn't know what McDonald's was until a lovely family member gave it to them well and truly out, you know, when they were really in school. Um, but they love sushi. They think that's a treat. Now, is that ultimately the healthiest thing I could, you know, have on the weekend with them? No, there's still things in that that are not perfect, um, but it's a huge upgrade. So it's not that you can't enjoy life. It's not that you can't go out as a family and celebrate around food because all of my happy memories as a child are centered around food. But those memories are around whole food that my grandmother cooked and my mother cooked and prepared and um, you know, cooked with whole food ingredients, meats and vegetables and, and fruits and you know, at least real butter back then, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. Even though not perfect, but um, yeah. So it's just coming back to those basics, making those upgrades, understanding that we have huge influence in that area with our children and, and just being real with ourselves, not judging what you've done in the past because, and not using it as another reason to beat yourself up because you're a failure as a mother. You know, that's not what we're yeah. saying. We're just saying, this is a new day. And what are we going to choose to do today for our best self and for our family? Yeah. And I would, um, so I just want to recap for those listening, because I think it's really good to take, 
take the tangible, like, you know, one of the, my biggest um, goals with everybody listening to this podcast is what do I do with this amazing information, this inspiring woman? So you said patience and persistence, know that it'll take time for them to like something. And I think sharing with kids, as you suggested, 10 to 20 spoonfuls is what it's going to take. And it might only be three today, but you know, we're going to revisit that and just see, let our system see. I think that's really cool. And I love the ownership thing. And that's definitely proved powerful in my household um, where we actually everyone in the house takes a night where they we call it restaurant night and they get to pick the meal and they make the food and they set the table and then we give constructive feedback um, positive you know and constructive and they love it they think it's a big game and for me it's like yes a night of cooking Um, it's awesome Um, but they take real pride in it you know like you said and I think that's the thing is whilst they're children they're not um not capable. And I think like all humans, right, we grow into the container held for us. And if people empower us with trust, Mm -hmm. then we'll naturally assume that we're, um, that that's an appropriate placement of trust. So then they have self-trust, which I think is really valuable. So I wanted to to switch um, channels a little bit. And, and, you know, you mentioned in what you just shared that women take on so many roles. Um, Yes. And much like me, I know that you're at the moment, unless there's something I don't know, a single mother. Um, so talk to me a little bit about, you know, I know for you in the last, you know, two years, 18 months, there's been huge changes, um, but that you're just, you know, thriving and really developing um, such a huge following, particularly for who you be. And, you know, you know, transitioning this from children, it's great for us to lay down rules, but it's more important that we are the embodiment of that which we teach because they are watching. And it's, I always say it's monkey see, monkey do. It's not what they hear they're listening through what they see and you know children I have two daughters that had to go through a divorce um, you know with their parents and I think the way that we as parents navigate that is so critical but I'd really love you to share your story of divorce um, what the learnings have been for you and what advice you might give to any women out there who are maybe moving through either divorce or big transitions yes absolutely wow Oh my goodness, it has been the biggest 18 months of my life. Um, Becoming a single mum was my greatest fear in life. And at the time in the relationship that I was in, I felt so incredibly secure that I couldn't have been more blindsided if I tried. Um, And yeah, it's it's been crazy. Um, (laughs) There's, look, when it it happened 18 months ago, uh, we have business connections my ex and I there's so many things as are that are so integrated um I think because there was so much on the line and so much at stake and luckily I had so many resourceful people and resources around me the best thing I did was get a coach to help me handle it as gracefully as I could with as much ease grace and flow because I was facing my greatest fear I literally anything that went wrong in life I was like it's okay because as long as I always have him and I know I always will. Like the level of certainty that we were going to be together forever was like a hundred out of a hundred. So I had the rug pulled from under me and ultimately my coach and I, what we got down to really quickly was that I had this underlying belief that I had somehow lost, I was less valuable as a woman being a single mum in the world and that I had failed my kids in that somehow as well. And so he really just helped me reclaim my power and value really quickly in a way that I truly have felt my value as a woman more than I ever have before, more than I did even within that relationship. So I've never loved myself more fully. I've never felt more free, um, more shiny, more expansive, more conscious. You know, Mm. I I spent 12 months with that coach being brutally honest with myself you know he it was brutal looking in the mirror we can only take responsibility for ourselves and what led us to what we are experiencing Um, I can never force responsibility onto anybody else that was involved other than to take my own accountability so um, in that time of healing I spent really looking at myself and working on myself because you know and and right now I am in another relationship and um, And regardless of what happens in the future and what relationship I go into, I don't want to bring those mistakes. I don't want to bring those wounds. Um, I want to ensure that I can be whole for my children, my girls. Um, And I think that's another um, huge, huge tip that I would give is 
ensure that your children are supported as well. I knew they are so, Adam and I have been hands on with them, you know, since birth as most parents are, but we've both been incredibly present day to day with them because of the nature of our work. And so they're very um, attached to both of us. And I was very aware. I could see that they were torn between us, mm -hmm. even though we were showing up lovingly in, in front of them. Um, and so I wanted them to have a space where they could talk freely. And I knew that they would be building perceptions based on their childhood view of the world and that they needed a space to work through that. And the best thing I did was find this beautiful um, counsellor who really just helped them, especially my youngest, was harbouring a lot of resentment in the way that she had seen things play out. Um, so that was, that was huge. It was huge for me to have that space and it was huge for my children to have that space as well. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot that you shared there and I'd like to kind of un unpack some of it for people yeah. listening because, you know, uh, you know, and so much of what you shared was very similar for me, you know, with a 17-year relationship to my childhood sweetheart, my best friend and my business partner. So very similar and again, blindsided, didn't see it coming. Um, yeah. And yet what I have learned, and it sounds like you have too, is that we do co-create everything through our wounds, through our ways of being, through our fear patterns and our programming, and, and that all we get to do, and yet it's the greatest gift of all, is the healing for ourselves, right? So one thing you mentioned, though, and I think that this is, is something I think is, is a bigger societal um, story is this this guilt that we do often feel when that nuclear, the concept of the nuclear family is... Um, yes broken apart or broken down and you know i often reference the fact that in our society it's called a broken family and yeah. quote unquote a failed marriage um and i get really frustrated with those terms because you know if two people can amicably separate into two new pathways and do so in in a really empowering loving respectful way how is that a failure you know and if if families and we have more blended families really now than the nuclear families um and so that that broken phrase does annoy me but yeah. i can also relate to this this kind of sad i always say the saddest part for me was having to um really put to bed if you will the idea of the fairy tale because much yeah. like you i thought i was going to be married forever i i didn't even cross my mind ever that i wasn't going to be married to my husband um that i was with and so I just would love you to unpack for people, how did you move through that guilt and that, well, it's a real powerlessness, isn't it? At some point when you're out of that relationship and it, and it's, it is happening and you maybe part of you wants it, maybe part of you doesn't want it to happen, all the things, but yeah. how did you kind of come to terms with the fact that this is our new reality or is that something that's still unfolding? I don't know. Um, look, I think, I believe grief comes and goes. It can't be measured and it comes at the most interesting time. So I've had another incredibly, um, and I'll be emotional sharing it, an incredibly challenging week because another dear friendship has kind of played out its course and that chapter has closed. So there's continually, um, what's the word that there's carnage that continues to come, you know, and if you see it in that light and, yeah. um, and you're so right. I think what we truly mourn is the loss of the dream. We're so attached to the dream and that's where a lot of the grief comes from. Because if I really break down the past few years of our relationship, uh, I felt I like I was drowning. I felt like I was being pulled under the water. Um, and a lot of people today will say, you're just a different person. You're so much freer. So I've never felt happier. So although I still have this grief that the dream didn't work or that my children, a lot of the grief, even if I speak honestly, the raw part of me feels at, at times, I'm so glad we're not together anymore, but sometimes I feel such rage that I only get to share in 50% of my baby's lives and yeah. and you know that's I've always been so into attachment parenting I've been there from day one and to have that choice taken off you as a mother uh that I feel rage over that in my most unresourced space when I'm not yeah. in a good space so there's many layers you know friendships there's so much that is yeah. there 
that causes pain and suffering, but it's the stories that we create, create around that that causes the pain. And so although ultimately it wasn't my choice at the time and I felt powerless around it, you get your power back by changing the story. Mm. I truly believe that this happened for me. I've faced my greatest fear. Literally, there was nothing that was greater than that as a fear. And I feel almost invincible today. I have no problem stepping outside my comfort zone and facing challenge today because I've faced the hardest thing in my life that I, that I never thought I would have to. And so even as the example of only seeing my kids 50-50, well, the flip side of that is I have so much time to focus on me, loving me, creating new happy dynamics in my life. I have so many new beautiful friendships. I have so much time to do yoga and all of the things that absolutely light me up. And, you know, I really did sacrifice 12 years of my life being a mother as a priority. And now that's obviously still a priority, but I've been able to put myself back up there as well. And, and it, there's just so many blessings and gifts. It's been the most challenging and the best 18 months of my life. And if I was to unpack the gifts, of course, mm. there are so many. Um, there's a beautiful quote that I read recently that talked something along the lines of, in our darkest hours comes the greatest light that we experienced, our greatest capacity for love, our biggest awakening, awakenings, which, oh my goodness, <laughs> the awakening that I have felt as a woman, I feel so much more connected to my spirituality, to my femininity, to my power. Um, I feel more powerful in business. I feel more present as a mother because it's more precious the moments I have with them. Um, it's helped me let go so much and letting go is what brings peace into our life. The more we are attached to things, the more pain we choose really to bring into our lives. Um, I've learned uh, one of the things that I'm still working on healing is there was a, a immense <laughs> level of betrayal in what I felt in what unfolded in my life. And that betrayal has actually been the hardest thing to heal. But the gift, and when I focus on the gift instead of being in victim mode, the gift is I never trusted myself for that entire relationship. I relied on his trust or his word and I never felt truly empowered as a woman to trust myself. And even leading into the sense of betrayal, my intuition for a good 12 months was firing on all cylinders. And I really questioned my own sanity instead of believing in myself. And so the lost trust that I experienced has caused me to trust myself completely. Mm -hmm. And my intuition is so strong and so powerful now. I just see so many signs and messages from God, universe, whatever you want to call it, my own, you know, just internal compass. Just I feel so directed. I feel so at peace with that. Um, yeah, and I just, I just feel really centered and strong in that. And I've never felt that in my entire life. And I would never give up that gift and to go back and, and, and change how things have run its course that I wasn't expecting. Mm. Yeah, Kira, gosh, I mean, I, I feel you so deeply in, in so much of what you just shared. And um, I often say also as a single mother that um, no mother ever has children intending to have them 50% of the time. Mm. And it is it requires a deep adjustment um, yeah. that is painful. And equally, if we can get to a place, as you then shared, that there is a lot of upside to having an opportunity to not be a mother. You're always a mother, of course, but to not have to be the primary caregiver on the day to day for a portion of your life. I feel that that gives particularly those women who are very prone to, you know, potentially like you were in the past, like a hundred percent all in, in one area, that's kind of let other areas die. And like you said, you know, you now, and likewise for me, my access to my femininity and my spirituality, it all woke up because there was space for it yes. because it wasn't, you know, because I wasn't in that codependent relationship waiting for someone else to reflect to me my worth or, you know, as I say it now, you know, my sovereignty. And I think everything you've just shared is a really common story for women who go through some kind of breakdown, if you will, yes. um, whether that's career, financial, health or mm. relationships, however they get gifted that kind of, you know, atomic bomb in their life. What grows from that is new beginnings always and every time. 
And we often need that bomb because I too, I know I can speak for myself and I feel like I see this in so many other women. There was no space for me to grow anymore in that particular dynamic. And without placing any blame, it was total 50-50 <laughs> in terms of what we were, you know, bringing to the table that wasn't working. Um, but there was no space for me to grow anymore. And internally, I was so desperate for many things that I'm experiencing now. And I'll never forget one of my coaches saying to me, you asked for this. Yep. And when I sat back and thought, yep. I really did. The challenge is we are often so judgmental of how the universe brings that to us. <laughs> it's yeah. not how, it didn't come in the way I expected it. I was okay. desperate for change. I just didn't expect it to look the way it did in order for me to become who I was supposed to be. And, yeah. you know, I think quite often people get stuck in the challenge thinking that, you know, it's so unfair and why is this happening to me? And we're almost paralyzed in that victim mode. And when we realize that these challenges are divinely designed in order to make us grow, I've mm -hmm. never felt more like me. I've never felt more in tap with my potential. And of course, there's always more space and room to grow, but I just feel so content in that and excited mm -hmm. for, for more expansion and growth. And so this challenge was designed for me. And so I can either focus on the grief and the challenges, which of course, it's important to feel those, just don't get stuck in that space. And when you transfer your energy to really see the gifts I think that's what helps you to put that one foot in front of the other. And, and actually the last thing I would say, if I was to say what really helped in my healing journey is to not get stuck in your own suffering, because when you're focused on self, you will always feel suffering. When you focus your energy outwards on others and, you know, you get into servant mode, I really, there's a quote, find yourself by losing yourself in the service of others. You know, in my lowest time, I still had responsibility to show up for my business where I empower women, um, you know, financially and um, in, in, in many different ways through the health avenue as well, obviously. Um, but I was also doing my weekly podcast at the time. And it was so hard to show up sometimes. Mm -hmm. But showing up helped me heal and it helped me focus my energy outwards. Mm -hmm. And um, there was, yeah, there was a lot of growth and healing in that. Yeah. So I, I think what I'm hearing and what I would echo as well is that, um, you know, actually one of my great yoga mentors used to say a pain is just a resistance to change or a resistance yeah. to what is. Mm -hmm. And so what you said so perfectly there is like the letting go of how it needs to look, understanding that it is unfolding for you, not necessarily how you want it, but it is unfolding for you. If we can let go of, well, let, if we can start to let go, you know, let go of what we think we can't survive without, then we, as you so beautifully, you can feel it in your, in your frequency, you know, that sense of empowerment and invincibility actually becomes available to us because when we come to realize that we literally can live without that, which we thought we can't live without, um, there's nothing that can steal your life or your power from you. Um, and so, you know, and I think too, what the blessing that children of divorce when handled well get is the realization that the fairy tale is just a marketing ploy. And actually what's beautiful is relationships that gift us with experiences and expansion. And that that might be for a reason, a season or a lifetime, who knows? But when, when relationships come to an end, if, if children get to watch that occur in a way that does not destroy someone, well, then they become agile and resilient in life, realizing that they're sovereign within themselves and life is just a wonderful opportunity to interact and connect with others and to move through all of those interactions and connections. Mm -hmm. I think that it's our desperate desire often to cling that holds us back actually. Yeah, definitely. Mm. <laughs> it's very so, painful. Clinging is pain. <laughs> cling, cl yeah, exactly. Just let go already. Yeah, let go already. So when you're a single mom and you're um, dating, you yes. know, for the first time well, in a while, what would be your, what would be your hot tips there for anyone who's in that, you know, experience, yeah. um, or resistant yeah. to it? Because, you know, I have a lot of clients in particular, and this, this is particularly not even post-divorce for anyone listening. I mean, young women putting themselves out there, you know, going on apps, like all of the things, um, oh, yes. lading is challenging. So yeah, what would be your advice? What have been things you've come to realize or learn in, in that experience? 
I'm so glad you brought this up. And I would, would speak to all women, not just, you know, because look, for me, this is a whole new world. I've been in that relationship for 12 years. Now, I, I don't think I ever even dated before that relationship, let alone the world has changed yeah. and, and all that craziness. Um, so um, it was actually my coach about three months in that's like, right, you need to get out and date. So I got the push to do it. I definitely felt incredibly overwhelmed at the thought of, ever being with someone else or having someone you know intimately in my space um so i think you do just have to get out there and face that fear because i did really find the fun in it really quickly but what i would say to all women is you know dating is a new beast and you don't want to get eaten alive and i've always had this mentality with anything i approach in life i i'm a researcher and so I knew the game had changed and I really wanted to understand how men and women were behaving out there before I went out and made too many mistakes. And I have made mistakes on the journey, I won't lie. And that's how we learn. Um, but I didn't want to make big mistakes that were going to potentially hurt me. And um, so I just watched a lot of YouTube things. I read some books. There's some really great books for women on dating and particularly how men behave. I think it's if I think it's so important before you date to be so clear on what it is that you actually want and what you want your future partner to look like because when you're clear on those things you can easily walk away from things that don't serve you. If you are clear that you're just out to have a good time, then go and have a good time. But if that's not your outcome, you can't behave in the same way if your outcome is to find someone who's wanting to settle down and have a serious relationship because how you show up uh, will potentially has a huge determining factor in how a man is going to value you and see you. And so if you want to have, I believe, and it's my experience because I've even played around with a lot of the advice, like a little bit of a game and it's kind of been fun. Um, but if you want to have a high value experience out in the dating world and you want to be treated with respect, you have to behave like a high value woman, communicate like one, and most importantly, have boundaries like one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that way you're not going to get hurt. You're not going to get taken for granted and the right men are going to create space and time for you. Um, and it's easy when you know what you're looking for um, and how you want to be treated without attitude and without playing a game, it's easy to walk away from things that don't fit in that. Mm. So you said um, you want to know what he looks like, but I, I'm, I'm assuming you actually mean like how he's going to be and what the relationship yeah, is. So not physically how he's going to look, just yeah, for no, anyone no, listening. No, no I, I have a mission statement and it goes through every area of my life. And one of those areas is relationships, but I want to be very clear here. It's not a list on, he needs to be tall. He needs to earn this amount of money. He needs to have brown hair. Yeah. It's how do I want to feel? I yeah. want to feel seen and heard. I want to feel honored. I want to feel valued. I want to feel a present, humble, you know, great masculine energy, um, not ego, you know, like I'm very clear on the kind of relationship, but most of it is actually about how it causes me to show up because mm. we can only take responsibility for ourselves. Yes. So how do you want someone to make you feel? Um, and, you know, right now I'm currently in a relationship where it, it meets all of those things. You know, I'm feeling seen and heard and, and I'm feeling the presence and that grounded masculinity mm. and, you know, it, it lights me up. And it's so nice to be clear on that and mm -hmm. to walk away from things that didn't look like that. But when I read it every day, the majority of it speaks it's about how I want to show up in order to honor that presence yes. in my life. And it reminds me every day because, you know, women, the nature of us is we are the storm. It reminds me to ground myself every day and to communicate like a high value woman, to show up like one, to be honorable and respectful and all of those mm. values that are important mm. to me. The cultivate yeah. a healthy relationship. Yeah, no, I think that's great, Kira, because you're quite right in, in, in assessing what you want the relationship to look like. It's really about who you be in that relationship. And then in embodying that frequency, that's actually where you magnetize the counterpart anyway, like energetically on a, on a quantum yeah. level, right? And I know when I work with women um, around relationships, one of the things that we really have to create a cognitive shift in them is that they're not looking for a guy. They're predetermining what they want it to look like what they want the relationship to be like who they want to be in that relationship. And then really men will come in and it'll either be like a, a synced in. Yes. That they're, a, they're a mirror and a match for that. Or 
thank you, but no, and then you let them go. And in doing and, that, you're really and they will leave too. If that because they will feel it's not that I have an expectation, it's I'm already happy. It's a bonus yep. when this comes along, but they will feel that they don't vibe with that too. They're either not yep. ready or they're not that they're not that match. exactly. So and it's so it's a coherence conversation. And then the beautiful thing is if it's not a match for them, then that's great. They get to go find what is, and it's great for you too, because then you get to create the space and welcome back in the potentiality of the man that will be a fit. But I think the mistake women make is they, they fixate on the man, then they want to change the man and they want to do the thing to make him the thing. It's like, no, just hold your vision, as you said, of who you get to be in relationship and what that will feel like. And then just keep holding it. Like don't not hold it and allow the man to see if that's right for him. And that resonance and that coherence will eventually fit. And when it does, it will feel effortless. Um, it's also more attractive for so a just as a little um, tip, because it sounds to me yeah. like you are reading your vision statement. So you've written a vision. Can you give everyone that little rundown as a, maybe a little tangible they could do every day? Um, yeah, I've actually done a YouTube on it, right? It's very comprehensive. It, um, you know, it's the most powerful. My coach helped me with it. It's the most powerful formula that I've ever come across. It's the only time I've truly felt passionate about reading it because of the formula. Um, so it goes through my purpose. My business is attached to my divine purpose. Um, and, um, you know, it reminds me every day, all of the things I, I think as women, one of the things we lose very quickly when we become mothers is our sense of freedom and flexibility and fun. And they're the three most attractive, alluring qualities about a woman. And we get bogged down in the stress and the strain of life and babies and, and all of that. And we lose the very thing that men are attracted to. And so, you know, it's, it's reminding yourself daily of all of those things that cultivate those qualities. Um, then it, goes through what I'm calling in, in or what my future is looking like um, in present tense. Um, and then I also have my superpowers. So reminding myself of my superpowers every day. And then the last portion of it is the relationship that I have and how I show up as a woman each day within that relationship. So it goes through parenting. It goes through business. It goes through my So quality. we'll link to that. We'll link to your YouTube yeah, in the yeah. show notes. That'd be great. And then yeah. anyone who's feeling called to can go and um, watch you explain it in depth and map their yeah. own one out. Because what a great tool um, for people to have. And I think- Whenever I feel yeah. off center, it brings me right back. It reminds me of where I am, where I'm going, um, and yeah, it just, it reminds me just to stay grounded in, in that and have faith in that. And the other reason I love it too, Kira, is women aside, you know, I think us as humans, we're far too reactive in this world. We're kind of looking yeah. out before we look in. And so having something every day that reminds you who you, who you choose to be and what you're moving towards, there's mm -hmm. so much power in, um, in, in making time and space to remind yourself of that frequency. Yes. It's so, all a choice. I love that, that you said that it's all a choice that what you're living right now experiencing and even what you're feeling is all choice mm -hmm. and having those daily habits and rituals and reminders so that we can come back to making those choices consciously that serve our highest good it's a roadmap essentially yeah, that's beautiful. And so if we can, um, as we start to wrap up, I want to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions. The first one may or may not be rapid fire, but if you could um, call out one book or one experience or one trip or one therapy or one thing that you did that you were like, that was like a game changer. I'm sure there have been many, but one that might pop to mind that you would be happy to share with people as, a, as something that just really was like a pivot point, a powerful pivot point. If I talked about the pivot point of my life that led to all of this that everybody else can access easily, it's a book called The Magic. If you're not living in a state of habitual gratitude, then life will not flow. And that uh, I was, um, my second daughter was a baby. I was in a lot of suffering. I was frustrated. I was bitching and complaining to my friend one day. Truth is I had a blessed life, we all do, right? And she looked at me and she said, I think you need a, to read a book called The Magic. And it completely transformed my life. It completely rewired uh, my natural um, set point in terms of how I think. So, you know, glass half, half full versus glass, mm -hmm. glass half empty. So I just have that natural peaceful state of gratitude as a habit now from that book. That's beautiful. Okay, which, we'll, which we'll flows into everything. Yeah, we'll list that out. And then 
Um, what would be the number one thing that you would recommend to the listeners that they could do today to elevate their energy? Get out in nature. Remember who you are. We live in these concrete boxes. You know, when's the last time you put your bare feet in the sand or on the grass and just breathed with the earth and remembered that you're from the earth? you know, yeah. and what's really important, you know, I have this beautiful home and I have beautiful things and I work hard, but the truth is none of that matters. What matters is being hand in hand with the people that you love and just coming back to, you know, nature and appreciating the beauty of everything that's around us. That always brings me back to myself. I love that. And um, what would be the number one tip that you would you know, tell the listeners today to elevate their sense of empowerment, that sense of personal power. One of the best tips I was ever given was um, quietening. My coach said to me, we all have the inner bitch. Expect her. She's not going anywhere. Just change your relationship with her. You and I still have the thoughts of I'm not good enough. She's prettier than me, whatever it is, right? Whatever your version is. We all have the bullshit noise. Absolutely. Every single one of us, the woman who's kicking butt and the woman who's too scared to move. It's just that we've changed our relationship with that noise because we understand we're not the noise, we're the person looking, we're listening to it. Yeah. And so when you can just give yourself 30 seconds to just breathe and remember that is not the truth of who I am. I used to go and stand in front of the ocean when I was building my business and I felt so far out of my depth and out of my comfort zone. And I would quieten my mind and realize the unlimited expansion in front of me, that is me. Mm. That is my soul. That is my spirit. That is my potential. Even though I feel fear, even though I have the noise telling me I'm not good enough, that I'm not worthy, I know deep down, I believe every human believe, knows deep down when they quieten the noise that they are worthy and capable of so much more because when you were born on this planet, you were worthy and deserving of all the love just like every other baby that's born and nothing changed just because you grew up or made a few mistakes. And so it's just getting in touch with that. Whatever ritual helps you do that. Yes. Great. I love it. I couldn't agree more. And so what would be the number one tip you would recommend to elevate people's expression in the world? So bringing that empowerment into, you know, you talk about, you know, you're building your business and you, you lead and empower women in that space. But what would you say to those people who are like, I'd love to be more expressed in the world. I'd love to have more impact in the world. Or I'd just love to even speak my truth more. Like what's something that they can do? That you would recommend or that's been powerful for you? Do you know, I started my social media pre MasterChef days um, just sharing the recipes that I was. My passion is, is cooking and, and healthy living. And I simply just started sharing my gift. We all have gifts, every single one of us. We're not all supposed to have the same gift. We're all supposed to be diverse. And then we work our gifts together. So stop comparing your gift to everyone else. My gift is cooking. And so I started on social media I then asked to audition for MasterChef it wasn't my dream it's just in sharing your gift all of these opportunities and doors start to open up mm. I felt a sense of reward I was a stay-at-home mom who had no other purpose other than my kids and so it was something to channel a passion into by doing that for free on social media that's yeah. the channel that I chose to share it through find a channel where you can share your gift or your thoughts or your voice. I share my voice in the area of health and women's empowerment because they're my two passions. Yeah. I personally utilize social media to do it. Whether you just get on lives, whether you just post, whether you just pick up the phone and speak to one person, you change the planet by changing one life. You mm. don't have to stand on stage and speak to a thousand people or have a podcast that reaches around the world in order mm. to change lives or to feel heard and to feel that you're living in your purpose. Mm. That's great advice. I think follow what lights you up and then share it. I think that's such great advice. And then really that's what expression is, right? Sharing your magic. Um, so Kira, if this is really the last question. So if somebody missed the entire podcast, it just, it got deleted and, and they literally got to hear from Kira Love, this one sentence you're going to share. Oh my God. I know, no pressure, but, but essentially it's kind of like, what's the, if you just distill everything you've ever learned in life, like just what's actually really freaking important. Like the rest is noise. And if you just were, if this was your last message to all of humanity and you're like, Hey team, 
I feel like I've learned a little bit, but really this is, this is kind of it. This is what I feel is most important. Just remember this. What would you say? I don't know if it's cliche, but the only thing that's really important and the only thing that's really real and means anything is love and coming back from love, working from love. You know, I really strive to come back to that every day in my choices, in my actions, in my reactions, which aren't always on point. Um, and just being a self-ignited source of light, it's no one's job to rescue me. It's, you know, it's up to me how I show up in the world and leading with love no matter the challenge that presents itself through that, it will lead you to where you're supposed to be. Yes, I agree. I have to ask you, is love your surname, your real surname? So it is now. So I still work in the same company as my ex and I just, I felt such a lack and loss of identity. And so I have just chosen to recreate my own identity and it's something, it was the only thing that I felt drawn to and that expressed who I am and where I'm going in the world and um, it really resonated with me and my daughters are going to have that as their middle name so that I have that connection with them as well. So as in you picked that as your surname or it wasn't your mother's maiden, it wasn't no. your maiden name before you got married? No, I didn't really feel a sense of connection to that maiden name either. So um, Kira, I just love this and I know we're technically meant to be done, but I want to talk to you about this because um, it's, I mean, Kira Love is such a great name, but I kept saying to everyone, I was trying to do some research. I'm like, is that actually her surname or did she, is it just a social media name? But there was no other surnames listed, if you know what I mean. And in the research I did, I couldn't really find anything. So um, I just wanted, because, you know, names have, and whether it's through numerology, they have an energy and a frequency. And I mean, obviously love is the highest vibration. So yeah. well done there. But <laughs> I wanted to talk about, um, I've actually played with in the past wanting to change my first name because yeah. my mother named me after my auntie. And for whatever reason, everybody thinks Maureen is a lovely first name, but it's just yeah. never landed for me. Yeah. And, you know, in all the years now that I've done higher self work, I have a different name for my higher self. Yes. She has a different name. Yeah. And, um, you know, in, in Dream Builder, we teach people to step into their higher selves. And literally my work is helping people be their higher self. And yeah. I was like, the other day I was toying with the idea of what if I just change my name to my higher self name? Because yeah. then I'm literally, like, it's such a strong standing. Yeah. And, and noticing the resistance in particularly the people around me, you can't just change your name. And I was like, why? I mean, even I could feel the resistance in myself, you know, like, what about my platforms and the yeah. things I've done and all those things? And what would people then call me? And would it be, a, I know that eventually people would adjust, but I'm really curious. I mean, surname is maybe a little different, but it's probably not as many. about the resistance <laughs> and um, if there yeah. was any, you know, or if it was I, an easy decision. Um, I didn't really have any, look, to be honest, I don't much care for people's opinions when I make a decision for myself. So I, it's not like I went out there and asked, what do people think? before I decided to do it. Um, I just, I felt not a sense of shame, but I just knew I couldn't stand me. I didn't feel attached or proud to have the surname that I had and I had to create my own identity and my own space. And so um, I just, yeah, I didn't feel like the old surname was me either. Um, and I'm drawn to light, but I couldn't find a word that meant that, that sounded right, and that, but love is light, and so that's just what it ended up being, and it just felt good, and I think follow what feels good mm. and right. It, just, it, it is, a, it's, you know, it, it does feel high vibrational. It, I never felt more like me, even with that name, and so people have just embraced it now. Yeah, that's people awesome. People have been nothing but positive about it, excited mm. about it. So I think if it feels good for you, don't worry about what other people think, just, just run yeah, it. Yeah, it it, particularly it was my daughter. She was like, you can't change your name, mum. I'm used to your name. And I think first name is maybe a little different to surname. Yeah, I think that's different. Um, just as, Definitely. you know, because people call you that all day long, every day. But yeah. I'm still toying maybe with it. And put it in front of your name. So maybe you could keep it and just put your new name in front or behind and you can choose when it's appropriate to introduce yourself as which personality, right? Yeah. Because we all wear different personalities. I have my, my um, personality name as well that is like my highest, funnest 
most confident version of me. Um, and yeah, I think maybe look at doing that. Yeah, I will, I will keep playing with it. But interestingly, my mum, who named me was really, she was actually okay with it. She was yeah. like, oh, if you don't like it, just change it. Yeah. Bless her. You know, because not everybody would feel that way. So it's, it's yeah. another attachment to things, you know, it's like that releasing that attachment and that identity. And Well, that was one of the reasons I really kind of wanted to do it. Cause I was like, this would be a full embodiment of that, which I teach, yeah. which is letting yeah. go of all of those societal conditionings. And it's actually very common in the yogic world for people to choose a name, you know, to choose their yeah. name and to kind of yeah. essentially take their sovereignty in that, in that way. But anyway, I was nervous that's... about social media and business and how everything would respond respond and how friends would respond but I think ultimately when you feel like you are your being your highest self and you feel the most authenticity that's going to shine through and it's going to grow whatever it is that you're focused on anyway yeah I agree I agree all right I'll I'll update you if um if there's any developments on that all right well Kira thank you so much for sharing so authentically your story and, and your wisdom as well um was there anything else that you particularly wanted to you know share with the listeners or we didn't touch on that you um, wish we had you know what? I, could, I could end by sharing the mission statement that i share with the women that i yeah. work with which um, is just a little thing that you can embody every day to remind yourself of who you are um and so i wrote this through the coaching and the challenges that i've faced over the past couple of years i'm an empowered high value woman strong yet graceful standing in my greatness yet humble connected and kind I lead with calm courage. I am self-aware and sure. I know the truth of who I am. I embrace my imperfections and I am flexible, fun and free to be me. I am a self-ignited source of light and the most magnificent I will ever be is myself. Mm, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That's just the perfect end to such a beautiful <laughs> um, conversation. You are truly... Um, the embodiment of love and what you do on the planet is absolutely service work. I see that all the time. And everybody um, that I, that I know that knows you says that constantly, the degree of value that you put out into the world is just truly high value. So I salute you for the work you do and the woman that you are. Thank you for your time today. Um, and of course, anyone listening, we're going to link to everything Kira in the show notes. And if you got something from the show, then please, you know, screenshot it, share it, link it to a friend, whatever you need to do, because both Kira and myself are really genuinely so deeply committed to helping raise the vibration of the planet and particularly both of us to empowering women. So help a sister out by guiding her towards, you know, inspiration and wonderful leaders like Kira. So Kira, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Big loves. Thank you for having me.